Welcome to Dune Club Session 5. For this session, you should have read pages 263 to 324, which ends with the beginning of Book 2, Muad'Dib. Previously in Dune, House Atreides have consciously walked into a trap, taking over spice mining of the planet Arrakis from their enemies, the Harkonnens. Paul's arrival is met with religious greetings from the native people. He's met with a failed assassination attempt and a perfect bird's eye view of the naked power of a sandworm in the wild desert. And let us not forget when young Paul also roasted that bitch ass gill banker spy Susu in front of an audience of his peers, the power elite of Arrakis. So far, Paul's mother, Jessica, has had to use the Bene Gesserit Missionaria Protectiva to manipulate the native Fremen people's religious prophecies to her advantage. She learns that there is a traitor among them only to become the prime suspect herself, and she is also pregnant with Leto's daughter. Meanwhile, the Duke Leto Atreides has worked tirelessly to secure his family in this hostile soil, only to be undone by Dr. Yui who leaves him with a new poison gas tooth and his home wide open to the Harkonnens. In session five, the Atreides are captured. Paul and Jessica are spirited into the desert and would have ended up as worm food if Paul hadn't used the Bene Gesserit technique of the voice correctly for his first time out on his ill-fated captor. Dr. Yui has given Duncan Idaho a heads up who flies after Paul and Jessica in a thopter. And in his final confrontation with the Baron, Yui finally learns of his wife's death before he meets his own. During an interrogation with the Baron and Piter de Vries, the Duke uses his weaponized tooth, narrowly missing the Baron, but taking his Mentat and captain of his guard down with him. Leto is now dead. Long live Duke Leto, and House Atreides has lost to House Harkonnen. In the desert, Paul and Jessica hide out in a still tent and while Jessica grieves Leto's death, Paul wonders at the horror of the profound change that has come over him. The trauma that he's experienced this night has ripped his mind open to the infinite, and this should have at least driven him mad if it were not for the extensive preparation and training that he has received his entire life. The veil of time has fallen away from Paul's inner eye and the new young Duke sees the past, is aware of every facet of the eternal now, and bears witness to all possible futures forever and ever, amen. And it's only after he accepts the truth of his terrible purpose that he can mourn the death of his father. The sleeper has awakened. Session five begins with one of my Favorite quotes from Dune, like I say that every time, like there's always a favorite quote, but here's another one of them. And this header states, there should be a science of discontent. People need hard times and oppression to develop psychic muscles from the collected sayings of Muad'Dib. And that bears relevance to all of the chapters that come after this chapter, because from here on out, Paul's life as he knew it is over he is now going to be on the run. He has become a gorilla house, just like his father said he might be. And he experiences oppression and real hard times. And these hard times, in fact, trigger him into new awarenesses. And on a personal level, there have absolutely been times in my life where I'm like, oh my God, I'm fucked. And like in that moment of desperation, I come up with something, like I break into some new awareness and then I save myself somehow with some new ridiculous idea that I come up with. So I think there's absolutely something to this. You know, we shouldn't coddle everyone. You need some pain in your life to get you to like figure it the fuck out sometimes. So now, Jessica wakes up bound and gagged and the Baron and Piter are talking about her, what to do with her. And the Baron trades Piter, the Duchy of Arrakis, for Jessica because he knows how dangerous she is. And he's like, Piter, we can't keep this woman around. So like, how about I just give you this planet instead? To which he accepts. She also hears them talk about using Yui's plan and order Jessica and Paul's death indirectly so that they can evade 
the Emperor's soothsayer, Gaius Helen Mohim, who had given Paul the Gum Jabbar test in session one. So even though the Emperor is in on all of this, he still has had his demands on the Barons, saying like, I need them killed like this or not like this. Like, and so they're going to have to talk to the soothsayer. And so they need to be able to play dumb so that they won't get in trouble. Cause they're definitely doing shit that the Emperor does not want them to be doing. Now on their way to die in the desert, Paul uses the Bene Gesserit technique of the voice for the very first time on someone in a real life scenario, he does it perfectly. He does it correctly. He gets the guy to take his mom's gag off. And then now we get to finally see Jessica really using the power of the voice, just running these fools. Like she totally deals with this situation. It's so awesome. And Paul gets his first kill. It's not like a conscious kill. It's more of like a, this is... <laughs> but he's and... just using the voice. <laughs> Beans. Beans. I use the voice. She does use the voice, actually. That's how she gets me to do stuff. I know what she means when she says stuff. I know. And Jessica gets this idiot to cut Paul's bonds, and Paul immediately kicks him in the chest with such force that it just kills him. And this is Paul's first kill within the books. Wow. Like right here, right yeah. here. Just psh, like his heel right here. You're fucking dead. Dang. See ya, Jago. <laughs> so back to Yui. We learn that Yui has tipped Duncan Idaho off about where to find Paul and Jessica. And before Paul and Jessica are flown away, he successfully sneaks the ducal signet ring which the Baron is coveting like no other into this frim kit that he's hidden in a special thopter before he's brought in before the Baron. In this exchange, Yui is relieved to finally learn the fate of his wife. He knows that Wana is dead and that he's ready to join her and he is murdered by Piter. Now Yui's last words to the Baron are, you think you've defeated me? And this idea, which he shouldn't have said that, he should have kept it quiet, but whatever, he had to, he had to get a jab in there. This disturbs the Baron. You know, the Baron keeps thinking about it. Like, what did he mean by that? What do you mean? Like, what did he mean? Because he knows he meant something by it. Like, there's some trickery afoot from Yui that he's going to have to deal with. And so Vlad is so thrown off balance by this statement, like being preoccupied with thinking about what Yui meant by it that when the Duke Leto is finally brought before him bound, the Baron totally messes up like his big moment. Like this is, this is the moment he's been waiting for for years is to get this guy and gloat over him about how he's destroyed his house. And he like fucks up the whole thing by saying, well, too loudly. And it's so funny to watch him kick himself over this. Like I got a really, I got a kick out of watching that. So back to Leto. He's drugged, he's sitting in the chair. He overhears that Paul and Jessica have escaped and he remembers the tooth and relaxes back into unconsciousness and awakes later at the table and notices the Baron's fat baby hands like compulsively touching things, you know, just like the greedy asshole that he is. And I love this detail about the Baron because he is this decadent and of course, like he would constantly be touching things because he wants everything. So while the Baron is interrogating him, Leto is preparing to die using this tooth. And he thinks about how much of his life has been good. He remembers this moment when Paul laughed at a kite, an antenna kite on Caladan. And uh, that's the moment when he finally bites down on it, exhales, and he just misses the Baron. Like, and he's so close. He almost kills him. Like, it's just like, ah, it's so freaking close. But he does get Piter, who is right beside his head, and everyone else in the room. Okay, so it's like at least Leto took some people down with him. And we see Leto's last thoughts as he's dying. And I think that they're so well written. His mind is catching everything, every shout, every whisper, every silence in the seconds before his death. And his last thought is seen in formless light on rays of black. And he sees this universal truth. He's like fulfilled by this awareness of how the day the flesh shapes and the flesh the day shapes as he's slipping into the unmanifest. 
And what that means is that he's realizing how people create the circumstances while the circumstances also create the people. It's this, this push and pull, this infinite tide that we're stuck in. Now that Duke Leto is dead, the Harkonnens have won, but let's review the losses that the Baron has received this night. Like we talked about earlier, he messed up his big entrance. That's a loss. He lost the Ducal signet ring when Yui put it in the Frem kit, and that was like a big thing for him. He really, he loves rings. He really wanted, he was so looking forward to wearing that ring around and being a badass. He also has lost Jessica and Paul. He's not sure if they're dead or not. He has lost his Mintat. He's lost the captain of his guard, had to hire a new guy, Nefud. He's almost lost his life. The Sardaukar have also seen how Leto has taken his own life and has taken a bunch of people down with him. And he's gonna go tell the Emperor and that's gonna make the Baron look weak and the Baron just cannot abide looking weak in front of the Emperor. That's the last person you wanna look weak in front of. And Vladimir has also lost his spice stores on Gidi Prime from an Atreides raid. That was talked about in the big meeting that Leto had where they wanted to hit them hard, which costs him so much money. I mean, it's the most expensive substance in the universe. You don't want to have your spice store destroyed. Also, now that Piter is dead, he's going to have to put the Beast Raban in charge. And he's upset because his plan was to put Piter in charge, who was gonna be a really awful ruler, so that later on down the line, Piter can be the fall guy, can get killed, and then he can introduce Fade Rautha as this savior of the planet. You know, he wants to make Fade look so good on Arrakis. But now that Piter's dead, he's gonna have to put Raban in charge, and he's related to Raban, and he doesn't want him to be the fall guy, but he's the only one he's got. And lastly, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen has even lost the pleasure of raping Paul Atreides. And this is not the sweet victory that the Baron had had in mind. Now back to Paul and Jessica who are hiding in the wasteland. Duncan Idaho has escaped during all of the chaos in Athopter, and he rescues Paul and Jessica moments after they kill their captor. In the fraction of a second before Paul understood that it was Idaho at the controls and not his enemies, when he feels this impotent rage of being caught and the naked terror of his own death staring at him, Paul is shook. Even though Paul evades being raped by the Baron, he doesn't escape the night unscathed. His mind is penetrated by the infinite and the agony of this violent contact should have shattered his personality. It should have killed him. And it would have if it had not been for the training, the refined pressures of sophisticated disciplines, the exposure to religious philosophy, and all of the strong personalities around him who have absorbed into him. His genetics and life experience, combined with exposure to the spice melange, prime the young duke, and the spark of pain ignites his awareness, and Paul explodes beyond the boundaries of time. His mind has leapt far ahead of Jessica's. His mind has leapt farther ahead than any other human in the entirety of the human race ever. And it's funny how the Baron was previously musing on how the whole universe sat open to the man who could make the right decisions. And now here's Paul, who has become the most woke motherfucker in the entire universe he can see into the past, he can see into myriad possible future timelines, and he's also completely present in the eternal now. Like, he's able to sense everything that's going on around him. And it's interesting to note that his father Leto, too, was struck by cosmic revelation, the universal push and pull of the past, present, and future, as his own consciousness passes into the unknown. Does he know what eight times eight is? <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he's a fucking mentat. Yeah, he knows what eight times eight is. He knows what like 
the square root of 823 divided by whatever the fuck, all right? He just knows it all, all right? The math is not a problem for him. It's a problem for me, but it's not a problem for him. I've just decided fuck numbers lately. I just, I don't care, like, I don't care about hours. I don't care about what date, what the date is. I can barely do math in my head anymore. Like, I just don't give a fuck. It's really hard. So Paul has had a revelation. And in this revelation, he now sees the spice melange for what it really is. That it's a poison so subtle, so insidious, so irreversible. It won't kill you unless you stop taking it. And that he and Jessica are trapped not only by the emperor and the baron, but their lives are now bound to this planet by their spice addiction. They are all in on planet Arrakis. The spice is in the air, it's in the soil, it's in the food, it's in everything on Arrakis. So you can't help but become addicted to it while you're hanging out on the planet. Paul also sees his true lineage for the first time. He sees that his mother, Jessica, is the Baron's own daughter, which would make the Baron his grandfather, from the Baron's only encounter with a woman who was a Bene Gesserit. And that Paul is something unexpected. He's more than a Kwisatz Haderach. And he finally understands what this feeling of terrible purpose is, that he is a seed produced by the machinations of the collective consciousness of the human race that the Bene Gesserit, the Emperor, the Harkonnens, all of it has brought them to this point where he is now able to bring about ultimate chaos in a stagnant and incestuous empire. Because life finds a way and life has chosen holy war because death is always necessary before rebirth. And with his new awareness, Jessica asks him, will the Fremen take us in? And he says, yes, and that they will call me Muad'Dib, the one who points the way. And that's exactly what Paul is. He is the one who points the way. And with this revelation, Paul has finally gained a measure of control over himself, and he's finally able to mourn the death of his father. So let's talk about the name Muad'Dib for just a second. So Jessica sees in this book about surviving in Arrakis that there's this constellation that is in the shape of a small mouse. Small mouse is called Muad'Dib. And the end of his tail has like their North Star. So Paul being called Muad'Dib by the Fremen, I mean, that's like a, that's a big deal. Like they do think that he's their, their pole star, you know, the one who will point the way. Like if you're ever lost, Go look at that guy and see what he's doing because he's going to get you there. It's like that. So let's go back to Paul's terrible purpose, okay? What Frank Herbert is saying is that the collective unconscious of the human race, of the known Imperium, understands that it has stagnated. We had the Duke Leto even talking about the degeneration of the great houses, and that's what happens within an imperium. You know, you have all these different royal houses and they try to keep the power in their family so they keep marrying one another until it gets, it, until you have this incestuous knot, okay? And then it's like, that's not good. <laughs> like you can't do that after a while. Like the stagnation in the gene pool is not good. And so humanity, which includes the Bene Gesserit and the Emperor and the Harkonnens, like Paul can't even be mad at them because they have all unconsciously created him and this moment and this situation in order for Paul to become a chaos bringer who will bring jihad into the Imperium, a holy war. And this holy war is going to spread, it's going to touch every planet. I mean, it's going to touch every planet and shake everyone up because things have become so stagnant within the empire. And there's gonna be a lot of death. There's gonna be a lot of uh, new families in power, like old families being ousted. There's going to just, like I said, chaos is going to ensue. But after chaos, you're going to have this great mingling of different people who've never had contact with one another. Like once everything is shaken up, then when the dust settles, it's like you're on a whole new level. And so 
humanity wants that. They want to have the gene pool shaken up in order to be able to survive whatever threats come towards them. Because when you stagnate, like that's not good. You need to have a proliferation of new genetic matchups. That's what happens. That's what happened after World War II. Just saying baby boomers, you know what baby boomers are a product of? World War II, World War II. Everyone's like, okay, we're done killing. Let's all settle down. Let's have sex and have babies. And just like, I would rather have babies than do a war again. Yeah, and once you're faced with so much death, it does spur you to want to create life. You know, it's, it's a real thing. So now get your questions ready for our live Q&A, which takes place on Sundays at 3 p.m. on Twitch and Facebook. So for session six, you need to read pages 327 through 370, which ends on the sentence, where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. And super bonus fun fact, if you want to hear me ramble about Paul's awakening as explained through Kabbalistic concepts through the tree of life, then you can check out my 16 minute crazy person video now on Patreon. Ooh.